So today we have the pleasure of speaking with Sergeant First Class Cornolia, recruiting out of Margate Station. Thank you for coming on. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So before we get started, uh, let's do a little social media plug. Is there any pages that you'd like people to follow you on? Yes. Yeah, so I have Instagram. Um, you can find me. It's recruiter underscore Sergeant First Class. It's SFC underscore K underscore. Before we start talking about your recruiting career, I'd like to ask you some questions and get to know you a little bit more You know, before you join the Army. Can you tell me a little bit about where you grew up and how, what drew you to the Army? Yes, so I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana on a Navy base. My father um, served the United States Marine Corps 22 years. My mom was a Marine four years. Um, after that, we PCS to Jacksonville, North Carolina, and I grew up there the rest of my life. Um, and then I joined the United States Army when I was 26 years old, and I've been in the Army 13 years now. Okay, and how much did your family play in that role of you, en you enlisting in the military? So um, that was one of the main reasons I decided to join the Army was um, growing up being a military brat. I used to wear my dad's hat um, and then go with him to work. It was neat to see, you know, how his daily duties were and the family oriented that the Marine Corps had. Um, it made me want to serve my country. So when I decided um, wanting to serve, my parents, you know, said, hey, maybe you should join the Air Force and the Navy. I went to a recruiter at both, and um, after meeting the Army recruiter, being able to pick everything up front, it was what really sold me, and um, I'm definitely glad. I only signed a four-year contract, and I had the you know thought of getting out after four years, and 13 years later, I'm still here, so it must be something amazing. <laughs> Absolutely, and now, what MOS did you decide? Um, so I chose 92 Alpha, which is Automated Logistical Specialist. Um, when I met with my recruiter, I was also offered 56 Might, which is Chaplain Assistant, and then Paralegal Specialist. But I asked him, I wanted something that was well-rounded and challenging, that I could do different things because I didn't want to get bored, you know, doing the same thing over. And that's when he told me 92 Alpha had different um, duties, and so I chose that. The Quartermaster Corps has served the Army since 1775, providing logistical accounting, material control, and direct support to our fighting forces in both supply and maintenance functions. And the soldiers the Army trusts to complete this vital duty are the men and women of Military Occupational Specialty Automated Logistical Specialist. How did your recruiting experience kind of help you in becoming a better recruiter today? Um, so that was one of the main reasons I wanted to be a recruiter. I had a very good recruiter. He took care of me. I did PT with him. He kind of helped me in that sense. But um, the real reason I wanted to be a recruiter because I wanted to do more um, to help my experience it would have been different. Um, so I wanted to give back to the future soldiers and do those things. So, you know, doing a more one-on-one uh, -on -one future soldier program and then sharing more information about the MOSs because I hear so many people um, to my left and right getting out because, you know, they didn't either like the MOS or they didn't know it was what it was or it wasn't great on career progression. And I wanted to change that because there's a lot of soldiers that get out that are outstanding leaders. And so one of the things that I did different was um, sharing the videos, letting people watch, you know, live um, things so they can say, hey, I can tell you what it is, but visually seeing it, that will help you, you know, know, is this for me? Would I enjoy doing it? So that was one of the reasons I wanted to be a recruiter. Okay, and now you haven't been in the Army for 13 years. Mm -hmm. How long have you been down here in Miami? Two years. So since being here, you've seen the highs and lows that often come with recruiting but you have also contributed to making Miami Battalion one of the best battalions in all of USAREC. You have been recognized as one of the top recruiters and your numbers speak for themselves. What are some of the keys to success that have helped you out in excelling as a recruiter when things are as rough as they are in the recruiting world? So um, my battle rhythm is I work Monday through uh, Thursday, um, typically doing recruiting things. So for example, Mondays and Tuesdays is typically my interviews that I like to do. Wednesday and Thursdays more my processing, either picking up source documents, building packets, etc. And then Friday, that's more where I, um, you know, go through everything, do my updates, you know, check in on my future soldiers, make sure they're good and everything. So recruiting wise, I do that Monday through Thursday but Friday is normally my processing you know my off day that I do everything you know that we do admin to take that pressure off 
Saturdays and Sundays, we don't work as recruiters, but I like to work on Saturdays and Sundays because nine times in 10, when you call somebody during the week, the last thing they want to do when they get off of work is talk about the Army. When they're already stressing how they're gonna pay this bill or you know if they're going through things mentally, et cetera. So when you call on a Saturday or Sunday, you don't have to do it more than an hour, two hours. Just call like five people, you get your three to five appointments lined up, and that way on Monday and Tuesdays, you already got your interviews and you can plug them in the system and look like a rock star, already have your appointments, but you did it at a um, easier, what is that? Will work harder not or work smarter not harder so that's what I do to be successful is I get my appointments on Saturdays and Sundays lined up for my Monday through um, Wednesday and that way that takes that stress off sending emails if you send an email no more than three to five sentences have your five W's your who what when where why and then also include a um, DA photo of yourself from your shoulder up you can go to um, Southcom they'll do it for free and you can do it at OCPs it's something about having a head and shoulder shot of yourself attached that email and then the army benefits of the full-time versus part-time so they can have a read ahead so then they will know what questions to ask because if you don't give them a little bit of information when you say hey what question you have they're going to say the first thing is well i don't know what to ask so if you put that in the email, nine times out of 10, they might not reply to your text, they might not answer a phone, but when they see a photo of yourself looking professional, the benefits and everything, I promise you they'll call you and that's how you get that appointment lined up. It's, that's the way they know it's not a spam or a scam you know, email, they know you're real. And obviously be, like, your hustle and being driven is one thing that sets you apart from a lot of your peers. The fact that you're driven has ex helped you a lot in becoming one of the top recruiters. What is it that drives you each day to better your last accomplishment? So for me, um, it was my career progression. So all um, non-commissioned officers know the new um, promotion system is you are not a promotable. You don't have that up the parentheses P next to your name. You have a number, that doesn't mean anything. Until you pin, that means everything. That means you officially made it. Um, so you can get a number and the months can go by and then you get recycled. Nobody wants to get recycled because your peers are gonna see that and I didn't want that to happen to me. So for me, it was the hustle of, hey, I gotta be in the top three to get that top block. I have to hustle because I wanted to get Sergeant First Class. And after that, um, I wanna get Mass Sergeant. So you have to be in the top three. It doesn't matter if I'm a good 92 Alpha. That means nothing in USAREC. USAREC is numbers. So if you don't have numbers, then what are you really doing? Um, so to be well-rounded, that was my motivation to you know, say, okay, I was in Eagle 100 this quarter. Okay, that's great, that's cute. What am I doing next? And keep it, the consistency. Um, and then it challenges you. You know, you don't wanna be known as the mediocre. You wanna be the best, but it is tiring. So um, that's where your, your why, why are you doing this? Um, what do you want to retire as you, the rank, you know, if that's your, your goal or do you want to become a war officer, et cetera? So that was my motivation was career progression. So I, I got to ask because you, you, you seem like such this driven person and I've heard the stories about how you hustle and you put these people in. Is this like a fire that you've always had or is this something that the Army kind of also helped you like mold into a, a, a more driven person? So before I joined the Army, I was an introvert. I didn't like to talk to people. Um, I was that person, I liked to work hard, but be in the shadows. I didn't like being in front of people. I would like stutter and stuff like that. Um, but recruiting really has helped me talk to people. It's helped me with my public speaking. It's helped me with social media. I never was the person to interview people and all that. So it got me out of my comfort zone, but the Army as a whole, it really helped my confidence. Um, I was always like, like I said, the person in the back and in the army, you have to do classes, MRT, sharp. They're always going to make you get out front. Um, and to be a 92 Alpha, it's very competitive to get start first class. Our points are high for sergeant and staff sergeant. So um, I always had to hustle. Um, to get awards because I never deployed. You know, back in the day, you used to get points for deployment. So when I was hustling to get sergeant and staff sergeant, I had to get military awards, do military schools, get civilian education. So it was always a grind. And um, if people think coming to USAREC, it's gonna be a chill ride, you know, you can sham. It's definitely not that. So um, you gotta come in it, you know, like um, Flash, you know, the cartoon from uh, DC and Marvel. You gotta be ready to go. Absolutely. So we have discussed briefly about the challenges that come with recruiting, whether it's 
the hours that you guys put in, where there's all the events that you guys have to cover, how important is it to find a support system, not just for your work life, but your personal life as well? So um, that is a very key. I'm married. Um, my spouse retired. I do have a son who's in college. So having that foundation uh, where they understand my long hours, I'm not just ignoring them because, you know, I choose to. It's not because my job's making me. It's a choice of my own because I want to be successful. Um, but learning to balance family time and work time, you have to do that. Um, but if you're single, you know, having a great station that understands, hey, you you don't have a spouse or significant other, but they are your family. So doing family um, get togethers at our station, we went to top um, golf before and just had on a Friday where we go hit some golf balls, but it helps that single non-commissioned officer know that they're part of a family also. Um, but yeah, you won't make it in USREC if you don't have that family support because you need it for the mental, physical, and spiritual aspects. With all these applicants that you've processed and when they go to boot camp and they graduate, how proud are you having seen their evolution from being a civilian to now being a soldier? That's one of the biggest rewards as um, a United States Army recruiter. Some of us, sometimes we get caught up in the numbers. Well, I put this amount of people. It's not what it's about. It's about changing their life, knowing you are the first person that they're going to experience. Um, and that's all they're going to know about the Army is you as a recruiter. Um, but seeing them graduate, it's phenomenal. Most of them came to do the correct push-ups, you know, run right. And then when you see them, you know, some of them are, you know, overweight. I had one applicant lose over 30 pounds. And it was just phenomenal to see his confidence growth um, for that. And and then I've had a couple get promoted in basic combat training and AIT and seeing them grow um, afterwards. Some recruiters, you know, like my recruiter, I don't even remember his name, you know, but I can tell you who my drill sergeant was. I wanted my, my future soldiers to remember who their recruiter was and know that if they graduate from AIT, you know, for the rest of their career, they can hit me up for mentorship at any time. That is not, you just don't get me just to get you in the Army. If you want to know how to change over to green to gold, OCS, or you want to know how to go to airborne school, hit me up at any time. You still have me for the rest of your career, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to be that drill sergeant that I remember. Drill sergeant Hargrove, I want them to remember their Army recruiter sergeant first class K. The families also play a huge role in this whole yes. process. They're, they want what is best for their loved ones, and rightfully so. How important is it for a recruiter to have a relationship or that open line with family members and not just the soldiers themselves? So nine times out of 10, the obstacle with an applicant is their family member. So regardless of them being 18, 19 or above, any age of 18, if they're single, always have a mom or dad come with them. Because if they're there, the child isn't always gonna know what questions to ask because they're young. If you remember back when you were 18, you thought you knew everything. But when you have a mom or dad, they're gonna know what questions to ask and they're also gonna become your support to make sure that they ship. Um, same thing if they're married, having their wife or their spouse come with them because nine times out of 10, when they ship off, they're gonna hit you up. My bill's not getting paid because I didn't get the money, blah, blah, blah. So if you build that that trust, that bond with them up front, you can kind of let them know, hey, on your first paycheck, you're not gonna get as much because they front you $350. And that way they can be more set up for success. And then they're gonna be willing to give you a referral because they're gonna be like, hey, you went above and beyond. Even though I feel like you've answered this because you've been very upfront and I think people who watch this are gonna get to know who Sergeant K is straight up. but. What can they expect when they get you as a recruiter? So when you get me as your recruiter, um, I take my gov with me Sunday through Saturday. It's on me. So you can call, text me at any time. Um, I always answer the phone. The other thing is my future soldier program. I'm really passionate about it. So as soon as they um, you know, enlist that day, they come back, I give them a certificate, take a picture of them post on social media, and then I give them a welcome uh, to start First Class K's team packet. And what consists of that is the Army song, the Soldier's Creed, the ranks, knowing what they look like, um, position of attention versus parade rest, um, ACS, MWR, Space A, uh, their medical information, and then I also have a picture of a soldier, how to put their uniform together because when they show up nine times a ten, it's not going to be sewn on. They're not going to know what arm the flag goes on and all that. So I give them that printout, and the last thing on the end of the page is a trap because I want them to come back and help me recruit. So I make sure they do their classes, how to get promoted before they ship, and that's something that USREC doesn't tell you to do, make you do, or whatever. It's just something that I took the time to build on my 
on my own and um, educate them. Um, so that way they can be set up for success. It's something that I wish I would have had. So I wouldn't have got smoked as people call it. Because, hey, I didn't know when I'm talking to an officer, go to a position of attention, what that is versus parade rest. So little things like that, it can make their experience be better. And they can actually get promoted because they're showing up day one already knowing that. They can be in a leadership role because they're different from their peers. So it sets them apart. And um, that's what you can get being on my team. And you're, oh, and you're going to have to do future soul training every week. Um, I don't let you make up excuses why not to be there. You're going to be there because you'll thank me later when you get that airborne school if you didn't get in your contract. Because when you show up, you're already physically fit, ready to go. And then when they ask, hey, who wants airborne school or air assault, you know, and you put your name in. I've had a lot of future soldiers that picked a job that it didn't come with, but they did the airborne physical with me and then they were able to get it en route from AIT to their next duty station. So that's a plus that a lot of them get that maybe you don't get if you weren't on another future soldier team. Okay. Seeing as we're in one of the most diverse places on the planet, you must see a multitude of different backgrounds and cultures. How has your experience as a recruiter here helped you out when it comes to addressing so many different walks of life? So um, becoming before becoming a recruiter, I didn't really know much about a green card, the process of obtaining it, etc. And it's one of the things that obviously now I know how to obtain it. Um, you know, the naturalization certificate, I'd never heard of that. Um, but majority of my future soldiers that have enlisted are from other countries. And it's very uh, phenomenal how somebody from a country of Colombia can come here, not even live here, maybe a year and a half, get a green card, and want to serve their country. Um, that speaks volumes because if I went to their country, I don't know if I'd have that same motivation. You know, so it's something that really tugs at my heart um, because, like I said, 90% of my applicants are from different countries. They're passionate. Um, they want to serve their country. A lot of them have bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and they have to pay to get that, you know, translated to either being in English or, you know, is it equivalent to the U.S. degree and all that. So they're dipping in their pockets to serve their country um, who they don't even really know much about. So it speaks volumes. And I think it's one of the things that we need to shine more light on in the United States Army is, you know, everybody can join and to, you know, salute them too because, it speaks volumes to their character and you know their religious backgrounds because some of them have backgrounds that go against like hair or whatever and they'll still join because this is their dream is to come to America and serve in the American Army and it's just phenomenal to be part of their journey um, to see and uh, like we were speaking one of them that I'm really cool about is you know hiring them from Peru and Costa Rica those were two countries you know I didn't know much about and being able to put them in the army um, the one from Costa Rica she had a doctorate degree she was a physician and now she's a 68 echo dental specialist and then a lot of them are on my team from Colombia and Brazil in my area that's their um, popular countries that they're from and it's just phenomenal to know that now now they can be in uh, what is it special forces with a green card and then aviation has opened up to them being able to have a green card and do the 15 series so I think it's awesome that the army is opening up a lot of those MOS's that they used to couldn't do with a green card and now they're able to do it I just think it's phenomenal we have all these options you know you go into one of these uh, armed forces recruiting stations and you see you know Marines you see Air Force Navy but why the army so um, I like to tell my applicants when they sit in the chair, the last thing at the end of the interview, um, I ask them, when you go get a car, you always ask how much is the car payment going to be, the APR percentage rate, what is that looking like, is services included, gap insurance included, and then the last thing you do is then, once you've negotiated everything back and forth, you then sign your contract. So I tell them, why would you want to join another branch when you can do those six things with myself and then the last step is signing so they can pick a job with me in my chair in my office the location of where they want to live in the u.s or overseas the length of contract start date college scholarship cash and then the last part is signing so they know what they're getting themselves into, whereas a lot of the branches on the other side, you don't know until you graduate basic combat training, what are you getting? Um, and you might not like it, so at least you can sign a, a three-year, four-year, five-year, six-year, um, and then test the waters like I did. I signed a four-year. I loved it, and 13 years later, I'm here. Because if you don't like what you do every day when you wake up in the morning, are you really living life? 
That's why I would pick the army.